Good afternoon. Um, my name is Pastor Roger Reed. And um, since things are, we might say, closed down and we haven't had church for a while, we're trying to going to do a video here and see if we can't get the message out to our, not only to our folks, but to anyone that might be able to be listening at this time. <clears throat> I'm the pastor at uh, West Jefferson Baptist Mission in West Jefferson, Ohio, and we are a mission. Uh, we are in a building program right now. We were hoping to get started next month or first of uh, June, but uh, we don't know what the situation is going to be now that uh, things are the way they are. But anyway, the Word of God is the Word of God, and we, we want to bring that to you this afternoon. I've never tried to scare anybody uh, into salvation, but um, I think in this day and age, people need to be afraid. They need to be scared. Not, not that we're going to try to scare you into getting saved, because we can't do that. Only Christ can save you. But need to understand some things in the Bible that what's going on in our day and time. So what we have here is um, just a tip of the iceberg, you might say, of what's going to happen in, I think, the near future. Uh, Christians are looking for the rapture. And that's where Jesus is going to come back and take the church and the, the saints out. And then at that time, right after that, seven years of tribulations are going to hit the earth. And it's going to be bad. And we need to get that out to people, whether they laugh, scoff, whatever it may be. We need to get that out to people so they may understand that they haven't seen anything yet. So, I'd like to read from Revelation chapter 13, starting at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell there therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads. And they had no man might, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. 666. And then over in chapter 14, starting at verse 8. And by the way, if you do have your Bibles with you, um, we are reading from the King James. Again, Re Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, 
in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So the title of the message this afternoon is Mark of the Beast. So what does that actually mean? Well, as we go into this, I'm hopeful that you may see and be worried, be concerned, and for you Christians, be concerned for the the very thought of your loved ones being in an unsaved situation, in other words, not knowing Christ as their Savior. We may be fine as Christians, but our loved ones may not be. So in Mark, as an introduction here, in Mark chapter 13 and verse 3 and 4, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? So they've asked a question. Jesus answers that question. And then actually in Matthew chapter 24, they asked three questions concerning the end times, concerning some things that he had talked to them about. And he told them straight up what the problem was and what was going to happen. They asked three questions, and he answered three questions. Then over in uh, verse 28 of Mark 13, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branches is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So there is a need to watch. Jesus is coming back, which we call the rapture. Uh, I am a what they call pre-tribulation saint. Uh, we have mid-tribulation saints, and we have post-tribulation saints. Pre means that he's coming before the tribulation. Mid means, just what it says, in the first three and a half years, uh, they believe he's coming back in, in the middle of the tribulation, and post-trib, of course, means at the end of the tribulation. We won't get into that, but um, there are those three views, and uh, there again, I believe that Jesus is going to come back, take his church out and the saints along, and we're going to go to glory with him, and then the seven years of tribulation is going to start. So let's proceed. In this verse that we just read in Mark, Jesus told us that we could um, identify the generation that would see his return. He said that the generation that saw the rebirth of the fig tree, which is Israel, would not pass until all these things were fulfilled. So let's look at some facts here. First of all, Israel was born anew. In other words, became a nation in 1948. Most everybody knows that. I don't know about the younger ones, but most of us older ones, we know that. 
The revived Roman Empire was born with the Benelux Treaty of 1948. The World Council of Churches was born in 1948. Now, you may know them three, maybe not the last one so much, but there's one more. The computer age was born in 1948 when the invention of the transistor by Bell Laboratories. That's interesting, isn't it? Is that a coincidence? Maybe, but I don't believe in coincidences. I believe that everything is according to God's plan, his will and his purpose. So what's going on right now is God's will. Regardless of what he's doing or allowing to happen, it's his will. This is all in his perfect plan. He's got a perfect plan. It's going to be followed through to the end. We may not like it, but that's just how it is. We can't change it. We can't change God's hand. We can't change his, his plan for our, our future. All we can do is serve him and worship him in spirit and truth. So we could go on for hours with such stories as these. But I believe, unquestionably, the generation of which Jesus spoke is alive today, and I think we are that generation. There's no doubt that most of the world knows a little something of the significance of the number 666. Ask almost anyone, and they will tell you that is the number of the Antichrist or the Mark of the Beast. Most people know that. Some may, as again, youngers, younger folks may not know that. But it is a remarkable fact that the numerical value of the ordinary Greek form of the name of Jesus is 888. This number is the number of perfection. Now, we're not going to get into numerology or anything like that, but just to give you a little bit of insight on the difference between Jesus and this Antichrist. Eight is also the number of new things. The name of Jesus adds up to all perfection, but the name of the Antichrist is the perfect symbol of imperfection and incompleteness. So that's what we have with the Antichrist. Six is a bad number. And when multiplied by tens and hundreds, it denotes evil in the greatest intensity and most disastrous manifestation. But the world thinks it to be a joke, and they laugh and snicker at such a number, not knowing or caring what is really and what it really and truly means. I've seen a lot of folks with tattoos of the very letter, the very number six six six. You may ask them what it is, and they may joke around and you know, give you some odd answer, or they may say it's a mark of the beast, but why would you want that on your body? I think John must have been saddened by what he saw as this unfolded before his eyes in Revelation there. It should make us want to cry out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If you look at the world situation today, you look at what China's doing, look at what our government's doing. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't know what they do. Now, there is a difference between Christianity and religion. Many people have religion, but they're not Christians. And let me give you an example. And I've had a lot of people get upset with me over this, but that's fine. Um, I'm old enough now. I can take it pretty well. Hitler was religious, but he wasn't saved. He wasn't a Christian, but he believed that if he could get rid of all the Jews, he could conquer the world. And he knew that. He had a belief that that's what he had to do. And in order to rule the world, he had to get rid of the Jews. Now, he had some advisors, and I won't make a comment on that right now, but they were religious advisors, and he believed that but he wasn't a Christian. He didn't know Jesus Christ. So we have a lot of our folks in government right now that are religious, but I doubt very seriously if they're Christians, if they know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. 
This is a sad state of affairs to be in. If, on, if people can only see the lies ahead of them and, and their very soul is headed for eternal damnation, wouldn't you think that would make a difference? Let's look this afternoon at a couple of things that are yet to unfold and are yet to come. And as we continue on, let me put something into your thinking that maybe you can work on during the week. Maybe you can um, ponder it. And maybe you can just meditate on it long enough and, and see if these things may concern you. Look at what's going on right now. Now, I don't go very much to the store since this has gone on. My wife goes to the store, gets what she needs, gets back home. But she goes to several stores because she can't get what she needs or gets what we, what we want or need. So she goes to several stores in order to accomplish that. She says the people are rude. Um, they're, everybody's in a hurry. Well, what they were in a hurry before this anyway. And nobody seems to care whether they run you over or not. This is just the tip of the iceberg, as I said earlier. This is just a prelude of what's really going to happen. Just think about this a minute. Just think, what would, right now, we got money. You have cash, which they really don't want. We can write a check. We have credit cards. And we can buy what we need. But what would happen... Right now, in this, in this time period that you see all this going on, all this chaos and all this rudeness, if people didn't have any money, they didn't have a credit card, they didn't have a check to write, and the only way that they could purchase anything or sell anything was have a mark on their body. That's kind of a awesome thought to contemplate that you could not eat. You could not feed your children. How sad that would be. But how would you, how would you react to that? How would you be able to function? So something to think about as we go to the next point. We only have two points this afternoon, and we're going to start with the first one. Who will receive this mark? Now, we read it there in chapter 13, 11 through 18. I would encourage you to read the whole chapter. But for right now, that's, that's what I read, and that's what I'm going to try to cover in this first point. There will be no respect to persons. In other words, the beast will not discriminate to whom shall receive this mark. The mark will be given to those who will serve the beast or Antichrist. So let's look at what the scripture said there, both small and great. Blue collar or white collar, it will not matter. Rich or poor, having all the money in the world or the poorest of the poor will make no difference to them, or to him, I should say. Free or bond, employer or employee, the beast will cause you to receive his mark. The word causeth, in verse 16, is more of a convincing and to show what will happen to them if they don't receive the mark. If we go back in there and we look at verse 16 once again, and <clears throat> get back to my text here, but in verse 16, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their heads. So he causes them to do that. I don't believe it will be forced on the people to have this mark, but all will be more than willing to cut or burn this mark into their own self in order to keep from starving. Not only that, what about your children? What would you do 
and you hear it all the time. What would you do for your children? Children, children come first, right? How far would you go to feed your starving children? How far will you go to feed yourself? So something to think about. I can't buy anything. I can't sell anything unless I get this mark. This will show the true depravity of man. In Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So what things seem right to you are not. And they could mean your very death. Be careful where you go. Be careful where you tread. Be careful how you react. Be careful how you act, even in today. What's happening today? So, the next question would be, what will this mark look like? I believe it to be a visible mark. One that you'll be able to see. There's much talk of the computer chip, and that might be so, but the scripture here is, to me, very plain, where whether there is a chip put under the skin or not, I believe there will be a visible mark. So let's ponder that for a minute. They could use a chip. The chip will be scanned. It'll have all your information on there. In fact, some states like California is up there are experimenting with no cash, no credit cards. If you've noticed some of the commercials on TV, they got, you know, a young boy there and his father and they're going through this museum and he says, what's that? Says, well, that's a wallet. Well, what's a wallet? Well, a wallet is something we use, they used to carry their money in and their credit cards. And then he takes his phone, he scans it, his watch, he scans it, or it's just his hand, he scans it, gets through, buys, whatever. So it's already in the process. It's not here yet, but it's already in the process. Now, I won't take time to read it because I, I don't want this to be a real lengthy video. But if you go in and look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 through 15, it talks about the word and to get it out to our children and our grandchildren and to each other and to put it on the doorpost and to put it in front of us and to, to read it in the morning and talk about it in the morning and, and talk about it at night. If you go in there and read it, you'll, you'll see what it says there. But there's a thing they, that, that's called a frontlet. And what they would do at this frontlet, they would take that and they would put scripture in there, certain scriptures, and it would go on their foreheads or on top of their head. It was a, either a little leather or little wooden box with leather straps, and I'll show you a picture of it here in a minute. And then it would go on their right arm. It would go up around the forearm. And the purpose was that when they were at the wailing wall, and in fact, the picture I'm going to show you, that's where this, this Jew is. He's at the wailing wall. And that's when they would wear it. And they would cross their arms like this. Well, on their right arm, that's where it is. And it's be the word of God would be close to their hearts. So let me show you a picture. Hopefully I can get it here with this, this situation. Right there is a Jew of today. And there is a frontlet. You can see the leather straps right there. But that's the frontlet. And the inside that frontlet is a, a rolled up piece of parchment or paper, with scripture on it. And that's what they would do. So the Jews wore the commandments between their eyes and on their hand. Satan is a great mimicker and counterfeiter. So we can believe the mark will be very visible. So he's trying to, he's trying to mock this, this frontlet. Now, if we turn over... Uh, to Matthew chapter 23 and verse 5, I believe it is. Matthew 23 and, and, and verse 5. It says there, and what Jesus is talking about is the Pharisees are trying to make a show of themselves. And uh, <clears throat> it says the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. But they were doing some things that made them puffed up and look like they were, you know, really great fellows. 
But in verse 5 it says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. It wasn't of God, it was of men. They wanted to show, make a showing. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They enlarge the borders of the garments. People see that. Oh, how fancy, how nice, how handsome that person is. The phylacteries are the same thing as the frontlet. It's just in the New Testament, the name changed. It's the same thing. So if you see what it says, they make broad their phylacteries. So they make them big. So people can see them sticking up. Now you see this man's here is a little small. Whether it was leather or wooden, but it, it's still there. So it was visible. Satan, the great counterfeiter, wants the mark to be visible to all that they may see. Hey, look at me. I got the mark. I can buy. I can sell. Where's your mark? Verse 17 says, It will either be the name of the beast or the number of his name. So I believe it will be unmistakably, and just by looking, you will know who bears or who does not bear this mark. So look at verse 18, once again, there in Revelation 13. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beasts, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. Again, 666. Now, we really don't have time to go into all the ins and outs about that, but it's just the, the message is for you to understand that this day is coming. Now, you may not believe that. You may think that I'm just old fogey that just, you know, one of them Bible thumpers, and, and that's fine to me. I, I don't care anymore. It don't matter. You can call me anything you want. You can call me late for supper. I'll get it eventually anyway. The thing is, Preachers, as myself, are here to warn you of what's coming. And whether you choose to believe us or not, that's entirely on your part. And I've even had people say, well, I've never heard such things before. Well, you may never have, but you can't say that anymore. And these things I'm talking to you about this afternoon, you may not agree with. But I always ask this question. What if you're wrong? No, I'm not saying I'm right or I'm wrong. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. But if you don't believe what I'm telling you this afternoon, then I have to ask. If you don't believe it, what happens if you're wrong? So that brings us to our next point. What will be their end? And I've already read Revelation 14, 8 through 11, so I won't read it again, but I would encourage you to go in there and read it uh, over again. This is a sad part because once they receive this mark, it will seal their fate forever. And I mean ever. Ever and ever and ever. Eternity. It'll never end. Your fate will be sealed. Then nation will be upon you for ever. You won't get some slick lawyer to come in and get you off like they do today in the courtrooms, it's not going to happen. Once the sentence is pronounced, you're done. If you receive the mark of this beast, you're done. Because of their believing in a false doctrine and unbelief of the truth of the gospel, men will not, will be doomed, excuse me, men will be doomed and will face the wrath of Almighty God. Look over here again in chapter 14 of Revelation in chapter and verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Oh, I know some Christians that would say, oh, God wouldn't do that. 
Oh, but yet God would. God has. God will continue to do that. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, God's wrath is going to be poured out on you, and that's just a fact, whether you believe it or not. We have to remember all who receive the mark of the beast and worship his image are the children of the devil. If you, as a Christian, talk to a lost person, you are talking to a child of the devil. The only way you can get through to that person is with the gospel and pray that the Holy Spirit is leading that person to believe it. It's the only way it can happen. People are using all kinds of methods today of quick, easy believism, salvation, and everything like that. But I would encourage you to go in and, and read. I believe it's in the, the <clears throat> chapter 8 and 9 of Acts. And it's, it's in, and it's in the book of Acts three times. It was that important, Paul's conversion. How was, well, I should say Saul at the time. His name was changed later. Saul's conversion. How was he saved? He was saved the same way salvation is today. It's no different still the same. So people are out there telling you different things about how to be saved. Well, they're wrong because if their way is right, then Paul's way was wrong. It's that simple. Paul hated Christ. He hated him worth a passion. He was on his way to Damascus to kill Christians, to put them in jail, to see them hung, to see them stoned. It was something he delighted. But something happened on that road. Same thing that happens to Christians all over the world, or happened to them at one point. The Lord came, and the Lord saved him. Happened to me the very same way. I wasn't on the road to Damascus, but I wasn't looking for Christ. I wasn't caring for God. I had no thought of them in my mind. And something changed. In a day, in a night, it changed. I can't explain it other than I changed. I became a different person. In John chapter 8 and verse 42 and 45, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. So, I'm telling you the truth, whether you believe me or not. You may not believe me. And I said, that's fine, but it's your doom. There in verse 11 of our text in chapter 14, those who worship the beast and receive his mark will be in torment throughout all eternity. Again, eternity. What is eternity? It's forever and ever and ever and ever. More and more we see the wickedness and the evil of mankind, and it is a frightening thing. That's why we're called to preach. We have a concern for lost souls. We have a concern that you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I don't know you. I know my members. I know some of the folks that may be watching this. There are members of other Baptist churches, but I don't know every single person that may be watching this today. But it's a warning. It's a loving warning. We care. We don't want to see anyone in this situation. See, the lake of fire was designed for the devil the Antichrist and the false prophet. That's where they're going, lake of fire. But all those who do not confess Jesus Christ at the judgment will be added to that. I've 
talked to several people and I, I said, where are you going to die? What are you going to do? Where are you going? Excuse me. When you die, probably hell. So you don't even have a concern. Well, why would you say that? I said, that's a horrid, wicked place. Oh no, my friends will be there. We're just going to have a good time and party on. That's not what the Bible says. I don't believe the Bible. It don't make no difference. <laughs> that's God's word. That's what he says. I believe it is truth. And if you don't believe it, I feel bad for you. Many want to see them punished for what they have done, but it will come soon enough. I, You know, if you look at our government, if you look at what's going on in China and different uh, leaders of the world, yeah, I'd like to see them punished now. But vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. I have to live by, with that. I have to live by that and say, sorry, you know, apologize to God and wrong thinking. I do want vengeance. I want to see these people suffer. But when I start looking at them thinking, oh, I'm going to be standing there when God casts judgment on them and casts them into the lake of fire. I don't want to see that. It's going to be an ugly sight. And I'm going to feel bad because they didn't listen. They didn't listen to Christ. So it's understandable that they're not going to listen to me and others as well. God will cast them into the lake of fire along with the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation 20.10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you're not a Christian, you're going to the lake of fire. Plain and simple. It's hot, pitch black. Imagine millions upon millions and maybe even trillions of people in the lake of fire, screaming and in torment. Can't see? All they can do is hear the other screams, the cursings, the screaming, the pain. We never really die. So the Bible tells us that the worm is going to eat on the body for eternity. There's going to be a worm. It's going to just continue to eat on you. How do you think that's going to feel? You're going to feel that. Again, I'm not trying to scare you into salvation, but I'm trying to scare you because this is serious stuff. And we're coming to it. It will not be long. And the Lord will come back. There is a possibility you could be saved during the tribulation. 144 Jews are going to be saved. They're going to preach the gospel. So it's possible. But I don't have much hope. Today is a day of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And what of those who will not worship or receive the mark of the beast? If the mid-tribbers and the post-tribbers are correct, we're all going to go through the, the, the tribulation time. I, I will too. If, if, if I'm wrong, and I, I, again, I believe in uh, pre-tribulation that the Lord's come back, take us home before the tribulation starts, so we're going to be out of here and won't have to worry about it. And the same question can be asked us, well, what if we're wrong? Well, then we have to endure. But I believe before that time even comes, there's going to be persecution against the Christian right now. And we're just seeing the start of it. I'm not saying the government's deliberately closing down churches. Some of our churches are still open. And I commend them for it. Everybody has to weigh it. Every church has to weigh the situation, weigh the, the health and the age of their people. So if you want to continue to have church... I have no problem with that. I just pray to God that you all be safe. One of my members said to me, in fact, he's on he's on YouTube, which this is going to be going there pretty soon. This is I'm done with this. That um, 
He said, I'm not too worried about having it, but I'm more worried about being a carrier and pass it on to somebody else and they end up dying. He said, that I would have a problem with. And I would too. I don't want to see anybody die because of my stupidity. And I'm not saying that, that you're stupid because you have a church. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But I don't want to see that. I don't want to be a carrier of something that would cause somebody else's death. I don't think anybody would. But anyway, let me continue here and come to a close. In Revelation 24, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Those who endure may be beheaded, they'll be killed, but they're going to spend a thousand years with Christ as he rules and reigns on the earth. Plus, for eternity, we're going to be with him. For the witness of Jesus Christ and for the word of God, they endured. If I have to endure, I have to endure. The early church, the disciples, the apostles, they all but John died a martyr's death. Horridly. Are we much different than they? Are we better than they? No, we're not. So whatever our end is, will be for the glory of Christ, not for our own glory, or our own wants, or our own desires. They were happy to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. We should be too as Christians. There is soil to be prepared. The Bible says the fields are wider than the harvest. We need to go out there and harvest a crop. I talked to one of my pastor brethren uh, yesterday and or the day before we were texting back and forth. He sent me a whole bunch of pictures. He's out there tilling the ground, planting seeds. He's even got vegetables planted and, and some of the stuff is coming up already. He's preparing the ground, preparing everything for the harvest in the fall. Hopefully everything will go well and he'll be able to get that harvest. But now we have a harvest. The soil needs to be prepared, the seeds need to be planted, and those seeds need to be watered. So that's what our job is. Prepare the ground. And talking to a person, plant the seed, the gospel, continue to water it. I can't make it grow. I can go out here and I can see my plants starting to come up. I can take care of them all I want. But I cannot make them grow. Only God can do that. Only God can save. He's the only one who can save but I can do what I'm supposed to be doing. So the rest we leave up to God. He will do according to his will and purpose. He will do according to his perfect plan. There are some of the things to come. Doesn't look very good, does it? And it doesn't look very good for some. Are you one of them? I pray the God you're not. I pray the God you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and understand as I understand. And come to understand and love him. And love him because he died for our sins. He died on the cross and he shed his blood for his people. I pray to God you're one of them. The Bible says in many places, but Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, I use that one, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When be saved, call upon the name of the Lord. You only can do that by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is leading you. You'll be able to do that. Then you'll confess your sins. You'll see what kind of person you really are. And you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Many today have that all messed around backwards. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't tell us to open up our hearts and let Jesus in. I've never seen that yet. I've seen, I hear it all the time, but I never see it. I've never seen it in there. I'd like to know where it's at if it's in there. Open up your heart and let Jesus in. Pray the sinner's prayer. A sinner can't pray a prayer. Salvation. He doesn't have the ability. He's a dead soul. And I can, won't get into that right now, but 
We invite you to come to our services when we ever get back open. We are a mission. We are in a building program. We, again, hope to build. We have a website, and it's going to be refurbished here hopefully this week. It's going to be all brand new. It's been neglected. You'll see some places that are empty, but there are some messages on there, and I think even this message that I'm preaching to you today, and the reason I'm preaching this to you today is because I want you to understand there's a worse time coming than what we're enduring right now, and I think we're enduring pretty rough time. We have a website. And you feel free to go to it, look it over. Again, it's going to be changed. Hopefully I can keep the same address, but it's westjeffmissbaptist.com. That's W-E-S-T, West Jeff, J-E-F-F, -F, Miss, M-I-S-S, -S, Baptist.com. We pray you've enjoyed this message. We pray that it has been a blessing and encouragement to your heart. And we pray that God may even use it to save your soul. And we'll look forward to our next time. And uh, we hope to be on here for a while. And even after we get back, we're probably going to try to do some videos and continue to do that and get them on our website. May God bless you. You have a good evening.